Chapter 2 Rome and First Century Judaism In the Jews, the Romans encountered a people with the strongest national sentiment, who had adherents and sympathizers throughout the empire, and who believed that their religion was destined to be the religion of mankind. The successive exiles and returns had divided Judaism into three main groups, those who remained beyond the Euphrates, in Babylon and elsewhere, and were now subjects of the Parthian rulers, those who returned to Palestine, and those, probably the most numerous of all, who lived as traders, professional men, and artisans in most of the larger towns of the grecio roman world, and in some provinces in the east, formed a part of the rural population as well. The Babylonian group of Jews only affect the situation indirectly. Their existence, however, guaranteed the maintenance of pro-Parthian sentiment among the Jews as a whole. Persia had exercised a strong influence on the religion of Israel, particularly in the development of the hope of bodily resurrection, the form of the Last Judgment, and an understanding of world history in terms of apocalyptic. Moreover, as a glance at Ezra and Nehemiah shows, the Persian rulers were regarded as Israel's benefactors. This favour was not forgotten, and when Rome was involved in war with the Parthian rulers, who were the heirs to the former Persian Empire, Jewish sympathies tended to lie with them. The statement attributed to the rabbi Simeon ben Yohai in the 2nd century AD if you see the horse of a Persian tied to a post in the land of Israel, expect the footsteps of the Messiah. This sums up the hopes of earthly deliverance at the hands of Persian military power. Indeed, the Jews in Palestine confronted Rome with the most difficult of political and military problems. The Law of Moses had envisaged a community free from all contaminating influences of neighbouring non-Jewish tribes and dedicated to the service of Yahweh. The long history of Israel, as preserved in the priestly tradition enshrined in the Old Testament, told of the struggle, often against overwhelming odds, of the Jewish people to live up to this ideal. Since the conquests of Alexander the Great, however, the Jews had, who had returned to Palestine after the exile found themselves faced not only by local heathen tribes, but by the progressive and all-pervading influence of Hellenism. Quite apart from the Greek cities established within the traditional frontiers of Israel, such as Gadara, Sepphoris, Gesara, Jerash, or Tiberias, Greek institutions and way of life exercised a considerable attraction for members of the wealthier Jewish families in Jerusalem. As early as 300 BC, an observer and traveller in Palestine could remark that the Jews had greatly altered the ordinances of their forefathers, as the result of their contact with Greek civilization. As on previous occasions, however, when the traditional Jewish way of life appeared to be threatened, a strong movement of opposition arose, the ill-conceived effort of antiquity. Antiochus IV, the Seleucid ruler of Syria, to absorb Israel into a single uniform Hellenistic state, to downgrade Yahweh into a local Baal, and to forbid the practice of the Law of Moses, produced violent opposition. The Maccabean Wars, 167-42 to BC, were in part civil wars, in part wars of liberation and they ended with the independence of Judea under their own Hasmonean dynasty. With all their cruelty, corruption, and violence, the rulers of the new Jewish state were determined that it should be free from idolatrous influences. To the Aramaic-speaking Palestinian Jew, Greek thought existed only to be controverted, and the Greek language, apart from the Jerusalem schools, was confined to the city territories of the Greek settlers. Meanwhile, Rome had come into contact with the Jews as an ally against the reviving power of the Seleucids. In 161 BC, Judas Maccabeus had sent an embassy to Rome to form an alliance, and this had been accepted. Even though nearly a century later, in 63 BC, Pompey had conquered Palestine and captured Jerusalem, the Jews continued to be treated as an allied nation, free therefore to live by their own religion and laws. Rome continued to ride Israel with a light reign. For the time being, the high priests at Jerusalem were treated as an autonomous power, 
and in 46 BC, Julius Caesar concluded a further treaty of alliance with John Hyrcanus, which ensured Judaism complete religious freedom in Palestine and valuable privileges in the dispersion. Under Herod the Great, Rome found another reliable friend, who, however much he may have been hated by his own people, kept Judea loyal to Augustus. When he died, on the 12th of March, 4 BC, his kingdom was divided between his three sons. Of these, Philip and Antipas kept their territories, but in AD 6, after ten years of cruelty and tyranny, the third, Archelaus, was deprived of his and banished to Vienne in Gaul. Only then did Augustus decide to place Judea under the direct rule of a procurator. Between AD 27 and 36, the procurator of Judea was Pontius Pilate. However discreet the Roman presence may have been, it was bound to arouse the same intense emotions among the religious-minded and patriotic Jews as the Seleucid government had done before it. The Jewish Sanhedrin was left in charge of local administration, and remained the supreme court regarding matters of Jewish law. The death penalty, however, it could not impose. A copper coinage was minted locally without the emperor's head, and prayers and sacrifices in the temple were accepted as expressions of loyalty in place of participation in the imperial cult. Yet for all that, apart from the Sadducean aristocracy who controlled the high priesthood, the Romans were hated, both as idolaters and as the occupying power. Like the British in Palestine after the Second World War, they served as general scapegoats for the cultural, social, and economic ills of the territory. The contrast, indeed, between friendly relations between individual Jews and Roman officers and generalized antipathy towards Rome as the representative of idolatry strikes a relevant chord in the contemporary world. At the time of Jesus' ministry, the evidence of this underlying hostility is to be found in the writings produced by the various sects into which the religious national tradition of Judaism had divided. In the New Testament, Sadducees, Herodians, and Pharisees are mentioned. The first two represented the ruling temple hierarchy, but the Pharisees were in the same tradition of nationalistic pietism and religious orthodoxy as had inspired many of the Jews who had rejected Hellenization under the Seleucids. Now they were equally opposed to a return of Greek influence through Herod and his Roman masters. Their views are well illustrated by the Psalms of Solomon, Enoch, and the Assumption of Moses, all of which look forward to the coming of a deliverer of Israel, an anointed one, the son of David, who would overthrow the rule of the idolaters and the backsliding Israelites who upheld their power. More significant even than the Pharisees, however, were the Essenes. These are not mentioned in the Bible, and until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, their existence was known only through the works of Philo, Josephus, and Pliny the Elder. At the time of writing, it seems reasonably clear that the covenanters of the scrolls were Essenes, and they thus present the historian with the possibility of looking into the minds of a Palestinian group who combined pietism and zeal for the law with an equally intense militancy against idolatry, including that represented by Rome. The sect saw itself as a holy community, the sons of Zadi, and the elect of Israel. They had retreated into the desert, as they said, to separate themselves from the abode of perverse men who walk in the way of wickedness. There they would enter into the covenant of the last days, which included active preparation for the final cosmic and military conflicts in which Belial and all his hosts would be destroyed. It seems quite evident that these, covenanter, uh, that these covenanters were the bearers in, and in no small part the producers of the apocalyptic tradition of Judaism. Their library at Qumran contained an extraordinarily rich collection of apocalyptic literature, such as fragments of the Testaments of the Patriarchs, Daniel, the Cycles of Enoch, and pseudo-mosaic works. Moreover, this tradition contributed towards shaping the apocalyptic tradition of the early church, and in particular inspired the theology of martyrdom and separation from pagan society, which dominated so much of the church's thought in the first three centuries AD. 
To Rome's difficulties in Judea were added the even more complex problems caused by the Jewish dispersion in the Mediterranean world. The successive exiles and returns from captivity had resulted in Jews settling outside the borders of Palestine, and this movement received further impetus following the conquests of Alexander the Great. At this period, and through the 3rd century BC, the relations between the Jews and their Greek-speaking neighbours were not on the whole bad. The Jewish religion was regarded as a rather peculiar philosophy, and the Jews themselves were accepted as good colonists, people who would cultivate the land and in general widen the area of civilization for which the Greek settler in Asia Minor and Syria stood. Thus, Antiochus III settled 2,000 Jewish families in Phrygia at the turn of the 3rd century BC as well-disposed guardians of our possessions. This, though the best known, was probably by no means the only organized settlement. Wherever Greek ins inscriptions have been found in Asia Minor in any numbers, there have been Jewish inscriptions also, and wherever Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey, they found a Jewish synagogue with its circles of full Jews, proselytes, and inquirers. In, in Antioch, the synagogue was a flourishing institution, and in Alexandria, the Jews dominated two of the five quarters of the city. There were Jewish communities in the chief towns um, along the North African coast and in southern Spain. As the Jewish philosopher Philo described it, the Jews settled in very many of the most prosperous countries in Europe and Asia. No one country could hold them, so populous were they. If one reads through the catalogue of nations and territories listed by Luke in Acts 2, one can see what an immense movement the dispersion was. In the communities where they had settled, the Jews often formed a wealthy and influential section of the population. Here, also, Acts is significant. We see them mainly as an urban influence, but as a powerful one. At Pisidian Antioch, for instance, they are associated with the chief people and with pious women, presumably wealthy also. At Ephesus, Paul himself numbered members of the governing group of this big city among his friends. In another town of Asia, Acmonia, the Jews had attracted members of the family of Julia Severa, related to the old Phrygian royal house, to their faith. At Laodicea, Apamea, and Adramitium, there were large Jewish communities who sent contributions in gold each year to Jerusalem as temple tax. At Stobi in northern Macedonia, we find a certain Tiberius Claudius Polychamus leaving no less than a quarter of a million sesterces to build a new synagogue and cult centre. In the first century AD, the Jews of the dispersion were economically among the most prosperous subjects of the empire. There, in part, lay the rub. For all their adoption of the Greek language and residence in the Greek cities, they stood ostentatiously outside the life and organization of the communities in which they had settled. Wherever they dwelt, their community life was centered around their synagogues, and their social and ethical life developed in organizations suited to enable them to observe the law. They subjected themselves to their own courts, and their rulers, even in 3rd century Alexandria, were reputed to have very great powers indeed. Paul himself, in 2 Corinthians 11.24, refers to his receiving on five occasions 40 stripes save one in a synagogue. A century later, the beating of Christians in the synagogues of the Jews in Asia was a common occurrence. They kept apart in life and in death from their pagan neighbors, burying their dead in their own cemeteries and looking for the future gathering in of Israel. This situation would have caused the Jews to be suspected and disliked, but probably not actively hated. The Jew, however, was not content to keep himself to himself. In the towns where he settled, there was continuous agitation and proselytization. Moreover, this was fairly successful. Thus, circa AD 75, Josephus, writing of the situation in Antioch, and after saying that the Jews enjoyed equal privileges with the Greeks there, went on, they also made proselytes of a great many of the Greeks continuously, and thereby in a sort of way brought them to be a portion of their own body. In Alexandria, the Jews there offered a friendly welcome to all those who were minded to obey their laws, and we know from Acts that many Greeks in the towns of Asia were so minded. 
Until the Greeks found a rallying point in allegiance to the imperial cult, there was nothing in their outlook strong enough to resist the appeal of monotheism, universality, the philosophy of history, and high ethical code that the Jews offered. The propaganda such as that contained in Psalm 115, directed against idolatry, or in wisdom against the outward manifestations of Hellenistic culture, reached its mark. The Greeks scattered about the eastern Mediterranean were settlers who possessed a higher material culture and pride of present and past achievement, but were threatened by vigorous alien communities within their walls who possessed a more consistent and more moral religious and social outlook. The result was conflict, sometimes breaking out in massacres such as that which occurred in Alexandria in 38, or in the scenes of murder and pillage that took place in town after town in Syria on the outbreak of the Jewish War of AD 66. This was a situation which challenged all Rome's powers of statesmanship in the Hellenistic parts of her dominions. The Roman position was rather different. In Rome itself, the Jews were simply one among many foreign communities with their own religion. Admittedly, they were numerous, their numbers having been swelled by the influx of prisoners brought to Rome by Pompey after his capture of Jerusalem in 63 BC, but apart from a single incident in 139 BC, when the praetor in charge of foreigners in Rome, Praetor Peregrinus, Cornelius Hispanus, ordered the expulsion of Jews who tried to taint the Roman manners with the worship of Jupiter Sabasius, the Jews appear to have enjoyed complete peace and calm in Rome throughout the Republican period. The reason is not too far to find. Romans and Jews first met as allies, an alliance which embraced the Jews both in Palestine and the dispersion. The Greek inhabitants of the city of Asia Minor were discrusted. The fact that they had joined Mithraudites Mith, and massacred the Roman merchants in their midst was not forgotten and when in the 50s and 60s the town councils of Ephesus, Parium, Haliacarnassus, and Delos tried to whittle down the extraordinary status of the Jews among them, the Roman government stepped in to protect the Jews. Thus, a decree of Dolabella, governor of Asia, soon after the death of Julius Caesar, reads, I do therefore grant them, the Jews, freedom from going into the army, as former governors have done, and permit them to use the customs of their forefathers in assembling together for sacred and religious purposes, as their law requires, and for collecting oblations necessary for their sacrifices. In a similar decree sent to the Parians by the praetor Caius Julius on behalf of the Jews in Delos about the same time, the Jews are described as friends and allies, and while their common meals and festivals were specifically authorised, others held by the Greek inhabitants were not. The Jews repaid these signs of favour with loyal service to Julius Caesar, and in Rome they showed an almost ostentatious loyalty to Augustus by naming a synagogue after the imperial house. The establishment of the imperial cult, however, and its immense popularity among the Greeks, brought about a gradual change. The problem of Greek loyalty was largely solved. The world became the Grecia Roman instead of the Roman world, though individual Romans may have continued to take advantage of their position in the provinces to harass the local Greek inhabitants, as they evidently continued to do in Cyrene in Augustus's reign, there was no genuine sympathy for the Jews either. In the same speech that contained a long tirade against the Greeks in Asia, Cicero pointed out how, even before Pompey's capture of Jerusalem, the Jewish laws and way of life were incompatible with the Roman. In Augustus's reign, the Jews were beginning to attract unfavorable notice in the capital. Horace mentions, Horace records contempt for Jewish superstition, and mentions how his friend Aristius Foscus had told him that he could not discuss some private affairs with him, as it was the 30th Sabbath, and he did not want to upset the circumcised Jews. A few years later, in AD 19, a trivial incident showed that good feeling between the Jews and Romans in the capital was beginning to wear thin. Josephus records that a noble Roman lady named Fulvia had become a proselyte but had then been tricked by unscrupulous immigrant Jews. Somehow or other, the affair got mixed up with some vicious conduct by priests of Isis, and the upshot was that the Jews and worshippers of Isis were treated with impartial justice and ordered out of the city. 
Some 4,000 Jewish freedmen were drafted to Sardinia to fight bandits in an unhealthy climate. Meantime, in the East, other factors were gradually moving official opinion against the Jews. In Palestine, there were vague but nonetheless real fears of a Jewish national uprising. From AD 27, the Jews had felt the impact of Pontius Pilate, from contemporary accounts, the first really unsympathetic Roman governor of Judea. While the Jewish authorities had protested bitterly against Pilate's intention to march his troops through the city carrying their standards, symbols of idolatry, Pilate was constantly on the alert for signs of revolt. Barabbas, guilty of insurrection, and the super- and the sup- and the superscription on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, sum up the situation at the time. It was in Alexandria, however, that events occurred showing how far Romano-Jewish relations had deteriorated. In the summer of 38, Greek and anti-Jewish extremists had come to power. They took the chance of a visit by King Agrippa on his way to take up his new kingdom in northern Palestine to riot against the Jews. Agrippa was mocked. The prefect of Egypt, Avilius Flaccus, openly took the side of the Greeks, and a horrible and destructive pogrom broke out. Though Flaccus was eventually dismissed and judicially murdered when in exile, the Jews were not recompensed. The Emperor Caligula, to whom an embassy was sent, was unsympathetic. Only his murder on 24th of January 41 prevented his megalomaniac tendencies from forcing a crisis on the Jews by insisting they place his statue in the temple at Jerusalem and worshipped it. Subsequently, both Jews and Greeks in Alexandria sent embassies to Claudius, nominally to congratulate him on his, asces on his accession, in fact to attempt to win the emperor's favour for their respective causes. Claudius's reply has been preserved, characteristically enough on the back of a tax receipt, belonging probably to a village secretary in the territory of Philadelphia. It shows the emperor as rigorously judicial. Both sides had been guilty of riot and feud, and were rebuked. The Jews should enjoy the privileges they possessed in the time of Augustus, but no more, and they were not to behave as though they lived in a city separate from their Alexandrian neighbours. When the emperor showed his true feelings, then the emperor showed his true feelings. The Jews are not to introduce or invite other Jews who sailed down to Alexandria from Syria or Egypt, thus compelling me to conceive the greater suspicion. Otherwise, I will by all means take vengeance on them as fermenting a general plague, i.e. disorder, for the whole world. Claudius realized that although the Greek oligarchies could be a nuisance, the Jews might menace the safety of the Roman world. With that realization, the Romano-Jewish alliance came to an end. In another quarter of a century, the Jewish revolt was to imprint itself on the minds of contemporaries as one of the greatest of all wars. It was no time for giving any favor to any offshoot of Judaism, but at this moment the first Christian missionaries were beginning to take the word beyond the confines of Palestine.